Well, hi there, film class. It is Dr. Bruce, and uh, when you watch this, it'll actually be Monday, April 6th. I'm recording this on the evening of the 5th, so I, I hope you each had a, a good Palm Sunday, and I suspect many of you watched Palm Sunday services online or, or something along those lines. So hope you're, you're doing well, and I hope that you are progressing in, in all your different academic work. I know that the transition to online has, has been interesting, not only for professors, but also for students. And, and even though I think most students are pretty good with adjusting to electronic formats, I do know that it can also be a, a bit of a bit of a strain to, to figure things out that are different. So I hope you're doing well. Just a couple of reminders for you. So uh, we have, uh, Good Friday is is listed or was always listed during the semester as uh, you know off from class. So I will be posting three Zoom lectures on the 1990s: one for tomorrow or one for April 6th, which is Monday; one for uh, April 8th, which is Wednesday. And then I'll I will not be posting another one until uh, just prior to Monday's class Monday the 13th so I uh, just wanted you to be aware of, of what our schedule is that's already in the updated syllabus but I just wanted you guys to know uh, I've got some some submissions for the 1990s with the book the film reviews already and I've been actually reading through those and and marking some of those film reviews so a lot of that has already been done I anticipate that as of Monday as of the 6th I will be getting many more of those 1990s reviews. So some really good films that you guys have been looking at. Here's what we're gonna do for this particular session. There will be three, as I said, on the 1990s. And the first session is actually gonna highlight uh, five films that I think are, are some of the very best from the decade. And in fact, these are such powerful films that I would consider each of them in its own way a masterpiece. And so that's where we're going to start. I'm going to do that first, and then we'll move back around to some of the different directors and some of the different uh, very popular films and, and some of the more influential films of that decade as well. But I want to start with, with these five. So just a reminder as well, like we've been doing, as I'm talking and, and giving you some, some insight on the various films and some of the production realities or some of the, the film innovations by the various directors. Uh, remember that I've also posted uh, a number of links on the Converge page referencing a lot of these films, and that is the case with each of these five. So at, at any point, it would be perfectly acceptable, actually probably quite helpful if you hit the, the pause button on this particular Zoom lecture recording and you could then look at these, these different links that I've supplied on Converge for a couple of the different film clips. So let me start with, actually I do have the slide here that we've been going through. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this this evening. A lot of carryover from the, the iconic film stars uh, of the 1980s. Many of them are obviously still working in the 1990s as well. There are a few up and comers that really begin to to make their way in the industry and get an, an awful lot more attention beginning in the 1990s and moving forward. Excuse me. Uh, so, you know, you have some stars like Kate Blanchett and Kate Winslet and Gwyneth Paltrow and, and uh, Reese Witherspoon who are getting an awful lot of film roles beginning in the mid to late 90s, uh, as well as some new up and comers for the, the male stars. Uh, guys like Daniel Day-Lewis, and a very young Leonardo DiCaprio are, are making their way into the Hollywood scene as of the early 1990s. And, and early on, a couple of those guys, like DiCaprio in particular, he gets a couple of really good breaks with some directors and they help to kind of catapult his career. So yeah, some of the, the new film stars from the decade worth noting, and there are certainly others, but I just wanted to mention a, a few of those in passing. Okay, we're gonna start with one of the films, one of the five films today is, uh, is actually two of the five films today are Spielberg films. So this shouldn't be a huge shocker. Um, 
the 1990s as as the 1970s had really been. Uh, it's not that the 1980s were a poor decade for Spielberg. Uh, he had some really good films in the 80s, but the 1990s were particularly strong for Spielberg. Uh, if you can see the the uh, film slide here, the PowerPoint slide, obviously when we're with the exception perhaps of Hook, which is not a horrible movie or anything, but it, it certainly isn't you know, anything close to a masterpiece. Uh, Jurassic Park, Schindler's List, Amistad, Saving Private Ryan, all of these films are significant and two of them, uh, it's, not, it's not wrong to, uh, to talk about Jurassic Park and I will be doing that later in the week, but the two that stand out as just these phenomenal pieces of filmmaking are Schindler's List and Saving Private Ryan. So I'm going to start with Schindler's List, and then we'll deal with Private Ryan in, in just a bit. Obviously, in fact, I've already seen a few of the film reviews coming in from you, and uh, several of them have actually been Schindler's List students who have, in, in three cases anyway so far, students that had not seen the film before but knew that it, had, it was highly regarded. Uh, for me, it is one of the greatest films ever made in the English language, and it is such a powerful movie that even now, I, I was watching some of the film clips earlier as I was gonna post them, and it's, it's almost impossible even to watch one of the film clips for you know two, three minutes and not get choked up by, by the subject matter and the ways in which Spielberg and his crew brought it to the forefront. So you all, you're probably at least loosely aware of the story. It deals with the Holocaust, but specifically with a man named Oscar Schindler, who's played by Liam Neeson in the film, uh, just one of his greatest roles, actually. Uh, Schindler was was actually very much, uh, you know, an entrepreneurial businessman, uh, a materialist in just about every way. And initially, he views World War II as an opportunity to uh, to make money through cheap labor, using the the cheap labor, wealthy, uh, the free labor, in a very real sense of of Jews in his factories. And so he's. He's very much this, this narcissistic individual at the beginning of the film. And what one of the things that you see is, as Spielberg humanizes this plot line, he's not only revealing the cruelty of the Nazis, he's not only showing the, the tragedies and the horrors of these, these Jewish prisoners who are transferred and ultimately work for Schindler. He's not just showing some of the, you know, the typical realities that we learn about with the Holocaust. He also humanizes this film through these characters, and specifically he does this through the lens of Oscar Schindler himself. And we see Schindler go through this, this redemptive process throughout the course of the film. And he, he has his eyes opened and he begins to, to pursue uh, means of, of changing the, the lives of these Jewish men and women who are working for him and to get them out alive, to get them away from, uh, you know, to get away, get them away from Germany and away from the Nazis through his plan to, uh, to kind of smuggle them out. And, and we also, one of his, uh, one of the great characters in the film is Itzhak Stern, played by the great Ben Kingsley, and they become not only uh, comrades as far as figuring out the ins and outs of making this scheme come to light, but also they become very close friends, and, and that's a, another great humanizing element. This is cast against the, the typical horrors that we would note. The, the, the worst character in the film is probably played by Ray Fiennes, uh, Amon Goethe, who's a, a commandant of a prison camp, and we see the uh, the viciousness, the evil that he represents, that his character is is putting on display. He obviously dehumanizes in his own mind. He's dehumanized all the, the different Jews. Uh, there are some shocking and difficult scenes in which he, he doesn't view Jews as human beings, and yet he is, uh, he is somehow... Um, allows himself to abuse and uh, sexually abuse this young Jewish woman in the camp. Uh, it's, it's really horrible to watch some of those sequences to be sure. Now, one of the things that, getting back to this element of difficulty with watching the film, one of the things that both 
you know, the you know, adults in my life, as well as many students who have commented on this film, they talk a great deal about, uh, you know, how traumatic actually watching this movie is. And I, I think that that can be very true. I would not, I would not debate that really. But I would also say that, that uh, the more I've watched the film, I, I see the genius of Spielberg as he brings all sorts of complex realities and issues to the forefront, making us deeply care about the, uh, you know, the, the various Jewish characters in the film, making us care. Obviously, uh, we, we, begin to, uh, we begin to connect to the Schindler character himself. And there, there really are some very powerful points, different points in the film where we, we begin to, to really uh, you know, feel the, the presence of the evil, but also the fact that good can be done in the midst of the chaotic evil that exists. And I'm always reminded, I tell students all the time, I'm reminded of this whenever I think about the Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, think about the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, who in, in some of the most difficult circumstances of life uh, surrendered himself to the Lord and and did un, unimaginably great service. And there is another, you know, very similarly here, we see this with Schindler, we see this uh, with other characters in the film, like Itzhak Stern, like Ben Kingsley's character, and it's powerful. Um, I, I really, I have to say that the more I have watched Schindler's List, the uh, the tragic horror of the Holocaust and the, the the small piece of that that we are exposed to in the film with these these Jews that are taken from the ghettos and and then those that are working for Schindler himself, we certainly are not spared the horror. That is not we're not asked to turn aside and and look away from horror. It is there for us to see and we must digest it. And yet Spielberg ha does something marvelous and difficult with this film because we are by the end of the film we are we are deeply moved by the sacrifices that have been made even as we we hear Oscar Schindler you know sobbing at the end of the film as he talks about the the idea that perhaps he could have saved more so I, I one of the things I I want you to do I posted two clips they they're two integral clips to the film and I think that they would help in this in this discussion. Uh, the first clip deals with one of the more famous clips actually it deals with uh, Schindler on a hillside on a horse actually and he's looking at this ghetto as the Nazis are moving through it and taking families and separating them from one another and and Schindler locks in on this little girl. And although the film is very fittingly shot in black and white as, as opposed to color, in this moment in the film, Spielberg decides to cloak this little girl, her little coat in, in red as, so we can follow Schindler's eyes. We can see what he is seeing. And, it, and the, the humanity of this girl who's, who's lost and scared and, and running from the scene and trying to flee and go and hide is a very powerful moment in the film. And, and Spielberg casts that just perfectly. The other clip that I posted for you is famously, it's, it's at the end of the film. And uh, actually I, I posted three clips. I posted the clip where, where Schindler is talking to Isak Stern and, and Stern is explaining what that list really is, the list that they're compiling of Jews that they plan to smuggle and get away to freedom, that that list is, is a list of life, uh, sparing these, these Imago Dei human beings from the horrors that the Nazis have planned for them. And it's a powerful scene as well. And then lastly, the scene where Schindler speaks to the Jews before he himself departs and before they are able to make their make good their escape as they're preparing for that. Uh, and it's it's just the, the perfect framing that that Spielberg brings to the forefront there as we see this man who has given himself over to this life saving process and it, it has all come home to him and he realizes 
uh, you know, the tragic horror of, of the Nazi final solution. And even though he in his heart knows that he has spared these, he, he wonders aloud to those gathered whether he could have saved more. And uh, one of the more famous lines in the film that, that I think is, is powerful, even though I think we would have some other theological uh, conversations and questions about it. The, the line in the film is, he who saves one life saves the world entire. And that, that speaks to the power, uh, the importance, the vitality, and the value of each individual life. And I think there's a lot of, uh, of truth to that. Uh, Production-wise, uh, you know, I think you can see when you watch the film how how actually the black and white format works magically well. It is it is the perfect casting. Uh, it is you're able to see shadow and light more effectively. What better film? What better subject matter to cast that in? It also seems to play well because we're dealing with the 1930s and 40s, with really 1940s here. Uh, and so it, it seems very fitting as sort of a throwback orientation with the cinematography. And, and man, it, it's just one of, the, one of the absolute phenomenal masterpieces of all time. Okay, I'm going to stick on Spielberg for a minute because then I don't have to come back later. Um, although I personally, you know, Saving Private Ryan for me is, is maybe a little further down the list somewhere. I, I, I have it somewhere in in my mind, it's always rested somewhere in the in the top 50 masterpieces of film in the English language. But it's probably closer to that 50 mark, whereas whereas I would put Schindler's List somewhere in, in the top five. It is just so profoundly um, important and beautifully made. Uh, Saving Private Ryan is also very very well well made, um, but you know as far as 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 separating those two films, I would certainly say Schindler's List for me stands, stands above. Nonetheless, Saving Private Ryan is one of the great films, came out in 1998, and uh, immediately, of course, audiences, all they seemed to talk about was the invasion sequence. And, and what I like, what I want to at least mention in passing as we dig into that, you know, that particular part of the film, what I respect Spielberg for with this film, with Saving Private Ryan, and also with uh, a series that he helped to produce, which is called Band of Brothers, many of you have probably seen it, is that you know, in, a, in a number of different war films, a, a number of different films that, that delve into that difficult subject matter, I, I sense that the directors kind of get lost a little bit, and whether intentional or not, they, they seem at times to be glorifying war, Again, that's not always intentional in my opinion, but um, gratuitous, unnecessary violence that doesn't seem to be uh, properly contextualized. And I will say, I, I don't enjoy watching that invasion sequence, to be honest with you, and, and typically I, I don't watch the whole thing. I will fast forward through a, a bits and pieces. But I would say this, that at no moment, there is not a single moment in this film where I, where I felt as if Spielberg and his production crew, his cinematographers, where, where they were saying, where they were um, using the, the violence as some sort of an ent uh, entertainment piece. This is a film which is bringing the stark realities of war to the forefront and it's showing the brutal reality, the cost of war, but it's doing so in a very careful and contextualized way. And I really respect Spielberg for that. Other great filmmakers have followed his lead and, and he's, he's standing on the shoulders of previous directors too in that regard, I suppose. But I think that's a crucial piece to this. The invasion sequence is what it is. Uh, I think it is very well done. It reveals what, um, what many veterans who I have personally interviewed uh, when it comes to the Normandy invasion, it's, it, uh, it, it certainly is a, a shockingly realistic portrayal. Not easy to watch, and yet that's kind of the point. And, and Spielberg brings that to the forefront. But here's, here's what I want to talk about with this film. Uh, one of the most famous events in human history in the 20th century, the Normandy invasion. And Spielberg finds a way in this film to take 
uh, real life situations, but also to, to, to insert in this film these fictionalized vignettes that bring an, a great deal of humanity to the film. And I think it's a, it's a profound way to shape the story. The idea that, um, that four brothers from Iowa who have gone off to fight in World War II, the fact that three of the four brothers are killed in combat, one in the Pacific theater and two in the European theater, and that their mother will be receiving notification of all three combat deaths on the same day, sets this story in motion. And it's a powerful sequence, the shot where, you know, she sees the car drive up and the, the uh, minister gets out of the car and she knows immediately that at least one or more of her sons are dead. It's powerful. Uh, but I love the way Spielberg frames this. He brings, he brings that to the forefront and uses it as the mechanism to spring forward. And, and in our, whether we realize it or not, this, this whole film and the storyline has, has from the beginning, uh, it has this added element of nobility to it. The nobility of the soldiers and their sacrifice on those beaches is already there for us to consider. And yet now we have, have something that's kind of, uh, you know, funneled down for us to a very personal level, level as we consider how worthy it is that the commanding general of US forces, George C. Marshall, would request that his, his commanders go and find this one remaining son, Private Ryan, played by Matt Damon. And, and from there, the story carries forward. And uh, this is not a play-by-play uh, -play of the plot. Tom Hanks' character, Captain Miller, uh, takes a group from his company, and they go off in search of Private Ryan, who's part of the, the 101st Airborne, who have dropped behind enemy lines. And their mission is to find him and to get him home. Uh, simple enough plot formulation, but a very effective one. And as I said, I, there's an awful lot of nobility to it. And so we follow this group of soldiers and, and throughout the film, there, is these, there are these questions. The soldiers themselves are asking Captain Miller, you know, what is the sense in all this? How, why, why sacrifice, you know, this group, even this group of soldiers going to look for this guy? Why, why be prepared to sacrifice our lives for one man? And you know, I love the sequences in the film where this, this comes to the forefront. There's even a great scene in a church um, where Captain Miller's sergeant, you know, asks him, you know, uh, you know, how do you feel about this, essentially? And, and, you know, how do we feel about the fact that this time the mission is one man? Uh, this time we are, you know, in a, in, in, to this point in the war, we've lost a number of soldiers in this company. Uh, and, and yet here we are, and the mission is, is not about all of our soldiers at once in this moment. It's actually about one soldier. And they discover, I think, throughout the course of the film that, that this is a very, uh, again, that, that this is a very noble effort. This is a noble cause that they're pursuing. And if they can get through it, they may actually be able to, to look back on their combat experience in Europe with... Uh, some semblance of of redemption that saving Private Ryan was not just about him, but that maybe there was this element of redemption available to all of them for pulling this off. The two clip clicks that uh, the two clips that I put on converge for you. The first one is a very powerful clip in which the Captain Miller character uh, finally unveils to his soldiers after they've been arguing over whether or not they should have let a prisoner go, a, a German prisoner of war. Uh, they're arguing and bickering and almost coming to blows with each other. And then Captain Miller out of nowhere says, hey, what's the, the pool on, on me up to now? What, you know, the, the pool where you guys all guess what I did before the war. And he tells him, he says, you know, he's an English high school English teacher. And it's one of the most brilliant humanizing moments in the film when we along with his soldiers learn who captain miller is where he comes from in pennsylvania what he does we learn that he's married because he talks about his wife for the first time and he says 
you know, he wonders whether he's going to be able to return to her in honor or shame. And that those things seize upon him and he thinks about them every day. And as he, he finishes this speech, I, you, you just see that there are all sorts of revelations going on in, in his own mind, perhaps, but also in the minds of his soldiers. And it's a very effective piece. The other clip that I posted for you is the tail end of the film. Um, spoiler alert, Captain Miller, uh, Captain Miller doesn't make it. And I posted his death scene because, because I think it's powerful, it's poignant, and, and it, there are some interesting questions that are brought to the forefront because of it. So in that, uh, in that final sequence, Captain Miller tells Private Ryan, played again, played by Matt Damon, he tells him, uh, because Ryan has survived this horrible last battle in the film, uh, where they are outmanned and outgunned and somehow miraculously survive when re, uh, reinforcements arrive. And he tells young Private Ryan that he to, to earn this, which is to say, my men and I sacrificed for you, earn this. And, and we find out later that Private Ryan never forgot those words and they were powerful motivators for him. So I, I want you to consider that moment in the film. If you haven't seen the film, you can just watch that clip and, and just kind of let that sink in a little bit. I think it's an interesting framework. Um, some have said that, that there's this connection to a, a Christian concept of redemption, but I don't think that really works because uh, we don't earn our salvation. We don't earn that redemption from Christ. So I don't think that that connection really works. Uh, but what I would say on, a, on a, a different sort of association level is this, that uh, I think we are reminded through the course of the film that all sorts of sacrifices are made by, by these soldiers in combat. And maybe in a broader sense, it's a reminder of all who have come before us, the, those who have sacrificed in different ways for us in our own lives. Uh, we have a responsibility to to live up to their expectations and to live up to all they have put into our lives and how, how they've contributed. And Private Ryan has this, this powerful moment when he has somehow magically made it through to that point. And we find out later he lives through the war and he goes on and gets married and has children and grandchildren. And, and yeah, it's, it's a really, really powerful film and, and just brilliantly shot, actually. The cinematography in that film is, is off the charts. A, kind of a grainy look to the film, and you see there that Spielberg is, is consistently just brilliant with his use of dark and light, his mixture of greens and browns uh, in, in the, uh, the rainy formats, uh, bits and pieces of sun sifting through and, and shining like a beacon for a moment, but then fading away. There are a lot of just brilliant sequences in the film. Okay, next. Uh, okay, yeah, I do wanna talk about Goodfellas for just a second. Okay, so Scorsese in the 1990s, the, the one film I'm gonna talk about now is Goodfellas. I actually am gonna come back and talk about The Age of Innocence. Uh, probably on either, well, either Wednesday or, or next Monday. But Goodfellas was a phenomenon when it hit theaters and, and moviegoers began to watch this film. Here's what I want to warn you of. Uh, this is not a film to be taken lightly. It's a gangster epic. It is brutal. It is, it's showing the brutality of, uh, of these gangsters for what it really was. Uh, and yet it's also, in a sense, because I, I clearly Scorsese has copied from Francis Ford Coppola in this sense. Remember the Godfather, Coppola essentially wants us to view the Corleones from the inside out as if we're almost like adoptive members of the family. Well, in a sense, that's what Scorsese has done here with the, uh, specifically with the Ray Liotta character. Okay, um, Henry Hill is the character's name. And so Henry is we, which is fictitious by the way. Uh, so the Henry Hill character uh, is Ray Liotta who's, uh, who's not Sicilian, but he joins a crew from a young age and, and we, we learn that he always wanted to be a gangster as he grew up in, in New York City, a, sub, a, 
uh, one of the sectors of, the, of New York City. And, and yet, I, I think what people were drawn to was not necessarily the brutality, but how, how normal these gangsters thought their lives were. It's one of the, actually, I think one of the more brilliant things that Scorsese brings to the forefront. You're, you're looking at guys like the Joe Pesci character, excuse me, and the Robert De Niro character. These are horribly violent men and they're prepared to, to commit acts of violence to preserve their way of life and to keep their, their own uh, crew bosses from going to prison or what have you. But everyone's in on it. They're, they're all in it together. It's almost, you know, these families, uh, these gangster families interact together. They go on vacations together. They, they come together for uh, child baptisms and they, they eat their meals. It is, it's a very clever set piece, the way Scorsese brings this all together as he merges it. And you are, asked, you are asked to come along with this surreal juxtaposition of uh, the, the brutal realities of gangster life and, and normal everyday activities that any family would engage in. And uh, man, I, I have to tell you, it, it is just so pitch perfect and convincing and and yet it's also brutal and difficult to watch. So I want to remind you, this is the warning that I want to put out there. Gangster, this particular gangster film is one of the most violent. It's certainly one of the most uh, brutal in moments of the film. And Scorsese uh, is doing that on purpose. He, he doesn't want to give the gangsters a pass, even though we're kind of invited in to experience this through particularly the Ray Liotta character. And uh, it is, it's a very interesting, as I said, and a very uh, well-crafted and executed film. The link that I posted for you guys actually is just the introduction and it's, it's Ray Liotta talking about, you know, they actually talk, start the, the film, the, the clip there, the, at the very beginning of the film, when these three guys uh, kill a, a person that they've had in the trunk of their car who they didn't realize was still alive. And then he's, you know, bumping around in the trunk and they, they open up the trunk and they kill him. And then this, the clip that I posted starts after that. Um, and it's, it's the Ray Liotta character saying, you know, even as far back as I can remember, I, I, I just wanted to be a gangster. And then he talks about, you know, what it was that drew him to the gangster world. <coughs> so that's the clip that I showed there. Very important film, uh, widely regarded as, uh, other than The Godfather, widely regarded as perhaps the best gangster film ever made. So I, I just wanted to mention it in passing. It is certainly, um, as I said, it's a, certainly a well-crafted and clever set piece. Okay. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Yes, Shawshank. This one, I, I suppose I don't need to say as much about simply because Shawshank has, has actually gained in prestige since the time it was in the theaters. It came out in 1994. And it's not that no one went to see it. I mean, there, you know, it, it had a, a fairly sound reception. It was actually gaining a lot of attention near the end of its theater run, but it was just, you know, one of those weird things where it was released in the theaters at a time when there were some other movies that got more attention and it didn't fly completely under the radar, but maybe just kind of to the sides a little bit. It just wasn't, uh, it wasn't initially probably as well received and well loved as it eventually became. When it was released to video, interestingly, is when uh, you know people who had heard, oh, I heard that was great in the theater, or that when it was in the theater, I heard it was great, but I, we, we just never went to see it. Then when it was out on video, I can tell you, people were renting it left and right. It was out of just about every, at the time, you'll love this, every blockbuster video store. I can remember going for days and days, you know, looking for a copy of the Shawshank Redemption, and they were just consistently out because everybody was watching it. 
uh, film critics actually did like the film. Some of them actually loved the film when it first came out in the theaters. But as I said, I, over time, I think people began to realize what a powerful, dramatic story this was. So the, the film is, the, the two key characters in the film are played uh, by Tim Robbins, who, whose character name is Andy Dufresne. And, and then the Morgan Freeman character, uh, his character name is Red. And they're just so perfectly balanced in this film. And Dufresne comes to Shawshank Prison, which is an actual prison in the, the state of Maine. He comes to the prison in the 1940s, uh, ostensibly because he has murdered his wife and her uh, illicit lover. And of course, Throughout most of the film, we just assume that Dufresne has actually done it, even though he claims he's innocent. Um, I'll get back to that in a minute. But we are, we are presented with this drama in which Dufresne and the other prisoners, especially those that he's close to, like Red and, and a few of the other friends that he makes, uh, we're shown the, the stark realities of prison on, on through the 1940s and 50s and, and into the 1960s. We're shown, uh, you know, just the uh, the brutal reality of prison life, uh, the dangers that exist. We're we're kind of given a a bird's eye view of how hopeless it can seem to the prisoners who are incarcerated. We're we're revealed. We're we're shown uh, how hypocritical certain uh, outsiders can be, or at least those who are in charge, the authority characters. So even the, the warden himself, who's always quoting scripture, we find out that he is a real crooked SOB, and that in fact he has been running all sorts of illegal schemes, and believing that none of it will catch up with him. But of course it does in the end. So this, the, the plot line is well executed. It's, it's brought together very well. Uh, Frank Darabont, the director, does a really nice job of presenting, you know, for a good reason, presenting the prison, the prison life, the, uh, the cafeteria, the jobs that they have, their walks around the courtyard. It's all very drab. There, there isn't a whole lot of, uh, of sunlight and brilliance and anything that seems to be overly bright. It, it adds to this feeling of doom and gloom throughout the course of the story. And yet it's in the midst of that doom and gloom that Andy Dufresne keeps telling his friend Red, he keeps telling him that, that uh, having hope in the midst of these dramatically difficult situations and in the midst of uh, a, a reality that appears as if it will probably never end for them until they are perhaps paroled when they're 70 years old or something, or just die in the prison, that more than perhaps if they were just on the outside, the, the necessity of hope is actually very, very much real. And he's a very upbeat person, Dufresne, uh, Andy Dufresne's character, uh, but we see that even his sense of hope is damaged and he's drained, slowly drained of it at different moments throughout the film. Uh, the, the clip, uh, that I posted for you with Shawshank deals specifically with uh, with Andy as he uh, actually two clips I showed uh, one of the more I think beautiful clips in the film is when Andy Dufresne gets up into the uh, one of the the rooms that that holds uh, where the gramophone was located and he, he finds and and puts a Mozart opera uh, on the machine and plays it throughout the pre he locks the door to the office so that the guards can't get to him and he plays the Mozart opera over the loudspeakers to the entire prison all the prisoners are hearing this beautiful opera music for for the first time in in their lives and most of them can't even tell what what the Italian singers are saying but they're mesmerized by the beauty and it's it's just a, a not only a very beautiful moment, it's an unbelievably effective moment in the film as Darabont and his production crew tell the story. Uh, the other clip that I posted is probably the most famous sequence in the film where 
Andy is with Red and they're sitting in the courtyard and Andy tells Red that he wants to get out, that he's paid his dues. We found out to this point that Andy was not actually guilty for the crime that he was accused of and did not murder his wife or her lover. And so we're, he's essentially been pinned with a crime he didn't commit and he's still sitting in prison. And, and he's talking to Red about his desire to get out of there, his desire to go and find, uh, to go to the Pacific Ocean, to a place, uh, a Mexican term, Zehuataneo, and he wants to go there and find a boat and start a charter service. And, you know, he's talking about all this. And, and Red, Red's response is, you shouldn't do this to yourself. You know, you're just, this is all false hope. You're just going to make yourself very upset. It's just going to be damaging to you. And famously, and one of the famous lines in the movie is Andy says, I guess it comes down to one thing, get busy living or get busy dying. That's the clip that I posted for you. I think it's a powerful film. Uh, the sense of redemption is certainly only partial. Uh, it is it is certainly very critical of Christianity because of the way it critiques the warden who's who's so seemingly Christian but pr proves to be an entire hypocrite. And yet there are still some really powerful things that the film observes regarding humanity and the power of hope and redemption in a fallen sinful world. And that there's this, uh, you know, the, the Shawshank prison itself exists as you know this kind of a time capsule, if you will, or, or a, uh, you know, at least a, a location where fallenness is so thoroughly on display and yet hope still exists. I think it's a very powerful film. Okay, the other film I want you to be aware of, I don't think I have a, uh, a cover, a film cover for it. Let me just see. I don't think so. Uh, nope, nope. Okay. So the last film I want to talk about, uh, actually real briefly, I almost didn't bother with it, but I think it's important, is a film by Clint Eastwood, one of his greatest directorial efforts, and he also starred in the film, and it's called Unforgiven. And I want you to be aware of it. I posted, I posted two clips from Unforgiven on the website, on the Converge page, and I want you to access those and look at them. Uh, in the film, uh, Eastwood plays uh, this uh, seemingly redeemed, right, uh, very changed man, William Money. But we learn very early on in the film that William Money had a very disturbing earlier life, and that uh, his the wife that he married, who who is is dead by the time this story starts. So the the wife that he had and that he had his children with. Uh, just just changed him and helped him to see the error of his ways and and uh, all of the violence of his youth was something that he distanced himself from and and this notion I mean the title is perfect because the clearly the William Money character struggles even from the beginning with with whether or not he actually has moved on and the, and whether or not he can experience any true semblance of redemption given all of his previous mistakes in life, but he clearly desires that. And I think one of the, the critical components of this film is he is asked to, to come to this town and deal with, uh, deal with a, a lawman named Little Bill as the character's name, played by, played by Gene Hackman in the movie. So William Money and again, Morgan Freeman is in this film. Freeman plays uh, William Money's friend Ned, and they go together to uh, to kind of evaluate this situation in this western town. And throughout the course of the film, we see all sorts of of confrontation with between William Money and uh, you know the life that he has tried to live versus the the, the life that he once had lived and whether or not his character really is true and good and redeemed. And it's, it's pretty, pretty disturbing and dark turn as we see uh, his friend Ned is ultimately murdered by one of Little Bill's men. And we, we begin to actually loathe much of what the, the lawman Little Bill stands for. 
And at the end of the film, I posted this clip. You'll see uh, there's the, the final confrontation where William Money comes and finds little Bill and, and walks in and, and threatens a crowd, a room full of men, and, and then tells little Bill that he's, that he's going to kill him. And so we've seen William Money, who has, uh, who is, seems to be pretty self-aware that, that he is a deeply flawed and violent man, that he has tried to escape that violent past, and yet he gives himself over to violence in the pursuit of what he believes is, is actually ironically righteous and just, especially the killing of his friend Ned, among other things in the film. Uh, I would just say it, it is a, again, it's a very tough film to watch. There are, the, the are you know, four of these five films are extremely difficult to watch. They're, they're dramas um, and, and there are some dark material in them, but they're also just so unbelievably stirring and, and captivating. It's hard to look away. It's, it's hard to, to not watch these films. And Unforgiven certainly is one of those. All right, guys, I, I went a little bit longer than I intended, so I'm gonna cut that off right there. Those were the five I wanted to talk about for today on or for Wednesday. So for Wednesday the 8th, I will be posting another segment, another Zoom lecture on the 1990s. So this will be Zoom lecture part one for the 90s. I will be posting Zoom lecture part two for Wednesday. I hope you're doing really well. I uh, miss you guys. and. And I hope, obviously, that we can all stay safe through this craziness that's going on around us. It's, uh, uh, it's obviously beyond disconcerting. That word doesn't really cover it. Uh, I think we're all pretty anxious, but know that, know that whatever happens, uh, God's on his throne. God is overseeing this all. And know that, that uh, I am praying for you. Know that uh, I would... You have no idea how much I'd prefer to just be together in our classroom. I miss, I miss seeing your faces. Uh, they're, they're delightful, um, but, but we can't be together right now. So the, that's the way it is, but we're going to make this work. I hope you're well, and I will connect with you guys soon, at least through Zoom in just a couple days. All right. See you. Bye.